So, so Tim uh, Noonan, you are Tim joining Noonan. us. And I hear you're retiring. I'm retiring in a couple months, right? That's a, a big loss. <laughs> now I know where people say you get busier as you get closer to retirement, and I'm real busy. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for joining us then. So, did, oh, do no. you want to weigh in a little bit? I know we heard from you last year when we did this. Yeah, I, I um, as I understand it, the bill would basically make the Judiciary Act the same as the State Employees Act. Um, yeah. So I didn't have any um, prepared testimony as such. The uh, laws are pretty similar. And um, I, I would say the existing laws are different in that under the existing Judiciary mm -hmm. Act, the parties can agree to go to arbitration instead of coming to the board. And I think that's always been the case since the law passed. Uh, we've never had a dispute. I don't think the parties have ever gone to uh, arbitration. Um, and I think the difference, as I understand it, the practical difference here would be instead of the parties agreeing to go to arbitration, one side can say, we'd rather go to arbitration. And if they say that, that that's what would happen if the party takes that position, which as I understand would be similar to the State Employees Act. Um, provision right now. So um, I assume everybody's aware that under the State Employees Act, the board has decided numerous last best offer disputes over the years. Um, just thinking how many, we probably have decided about 10 between state and uh, VSEA, executive branch, state colleges and the faculty federation. We have not had any with UVM although that's possible, it uh, could happen, but we haven't had any. Um, so, I mean, what I would testify to is the board has had a lot of experience in last best offers. Um, we have always stayed within the timeline set up by statute. I can testify to that, the 30 days provided by statute. Um, and, um, and I certainly can answer any questions about the board versus arbitration, anything you want to know or have questions about as to what the differences may be uh, with respect to going before the board uh, as opposed to going to arbitration. I think I testified to that last year uh, to some extent in response to questions. So perfectly happy to respond to any things that may have come up. I haven't heard any of the testimony um, and I do apologize. I, was, I had an unavoidable training session actually involving <laughs> judiciary employees and, uh, and manage, uh, judiciary um, supervisors and, and VSEA stewards. We had a training session today uh, for that group. So um, that's where I was. So I was involved in judiciary issues before coming here today. Um, but again, I'm perfectly happy to respond to questions. Um, any questions that came up? Uh, uh, Senator Clarkson? Yeah, no, I'm sorry. I thought Steve said uh, just before we went on break that that one of the, that the arbitrator that had to be mutually agreed upon. And Tim, you just said something that seemed a little different from that. Okay. Um, what I was referring to was one, one side can say, we'd rather go to the arbitrator than to the board to go through the arbitration process uh, instead of going to the board and one party can uh, dictate that result. That's what I meant, not the particular arbitrator. And, and I don't know, Senator Clarkson, if that's what you were referring to, that the parties typically would agree to an arbitrator. And if not, um, is it the AAA? Do the parties go through the AAA to, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yeah, so, so it was just different. Is that clear, Senator Clark, so what the different distinction was? Um, it's whether you go to the labor board or go to arbitration. One side can say, we want to go to arbitration, and that's what happens. Um, but the arbitrator is, has to be agreed upon by both parties. Yeah, the arbitrator, yeah, once you get to, once the party makes that selection, and they, it's been decided to go to arbitration, then it would be mutually agreed upon by the parties. Right. Under the existing statute, the difference would be it, it, it would come to the labor board, you know, and, um, and or the parties could agree to go to arbitration. 
mutually agree to go to arbitration um, as opposed to coming to the labor board. I'm not trying to confuse it, uh, but that's the that was a distinction that I was. If if uh, I may, just very briefly, uh, if the 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 private arbitration process does not always operate on the basis of a mutually approved arbitrator. You try for that, but the, the AAA process is such that if you can't agree, if the two parties cannot agree on an arbitrator, you're given a list with a number of names on that list and you rate those people in descending order. And the individual who is closest to the top of both lists is the, um, is the person selected in that situation. So uh, it could be, let's say the employer's fifth choice and the employee group's third choice. Um, but that's the, that's the way it works because um, you, you can't always agree on who is the appropriate arbitrator for the matter. Excuse me. A little bit like ranked choice voting. Right. <laughs> Madam Chair, if I might, yeah. if it's okay with you. Yes. Just, if I could just clarify. So Senator Clarkson, what I was talking about is currently the governor chooses the labor board members. So one person chooses who's gonna be on the panel. Um, uh, in, in an arbitration situation, yes, a single party can decide to go to the arbitrator, but uh, but both parties have equal power in choosing who the arbitrator would be in the, the system that Mr. McNeil just described is um, essentially a role that would not exist if it went to the labor board. We would not have any say about that. That would be a decision about the governor, uh, the, the governor made uh, previously. So it's much more of an equal position when both the workers and the management can decide who the arbitrator will be. Does that answer your question, Senator Clarkson? Okay. Yes, thank you. Any more I, questions for Tim? I had a question for Tim and I should remember it, but I asked it before the break. And so I'm gonna ask it again, just because I know so much of this stems from our concern two years ago with the appointment uh, that I actually was responsible for um, that had to confirm. Uh, when was the last time, Tim, that the that the VLRB was overhaul, you know, we, we took a look at and re, re, rework the VLRB. I mean, when was the last time it had any sort of structural change or, or improvements made to it or, and, and as you think about departing, I would love, you know, it would be great to hear from you about what we could do to improve the VLRB. The, um... The last time there was a significant change, structural change was 2006. Mm -hmm. um, before then you had a five member board appointed essentially by political party basis. Yep. You did not have more than three members of the same political party. You had a panel system of three members. No more than two members could be of the same political party. In practice, um, there were it was not unusual to have a significant percentage of the board be independents is the way it really in practice, the way it played out, that they were not, uh, they, not they did not denote themselves as either Democrats or Republicans, but as independents. So, so you pretty much had that kind of a mix there. You had Democrats, you had Republicans, and you had independents. And then in 06, it was changed um, to have two members with a neutral background two members with a management background, two members with a labor background, a six member board, but you had a panel of three typically that hears cases. And the panel of three will be one member with a neutral background, one with the management, one with the labor. So that's that was the most significant. There were other parts of that, but that was the major change. Right, that was the change in party, At least party designation to what is called tripartite that you would have representation in this tripartite manner. I actually believe I reported that bill on the floor because I think it came through GovOps because it was a board change. 
You have a better yeah. memory than me. I, I think that might be the case. But <laughs> I, because I can remember. Um, yeah, the other the other thing I it, about. All, we always say that no more than one or two or something should be of the same political party, but that is in Vermont kind of almost a joke because people don't register as in a political party. So it's really, um, unless you've run for a political office as a partisan, you can say, oh, I think they're Republican or I think they're Democrat, but so anyway, that's just an observation about most of the time when we put that in as a provision. Any other questions for Tim or anybody else? So what did you decide about the uh, vote, Senator Polina? Well, we didn't decide on a vote. We decided to wait till you got back. Um, if someone wants to make a motion, we can take a vote. That's the way I would look at it. Is anybody, does anybody want to make a motion? I'm happy to move this. I think, I think it's time to call it to question, um, especially with other witnesses waiting and yep. we've heard what we need to hear. So um, I would move um, S78 and is it as introduced? I don't think we've made any changes. We haven't made any changes. Okay, do you want to call the the roll? Sure. Senator Clarkson? Yes. Senator Collimore? Yes. Senator Polina? Yes. Self Senator Rom, yes. Senator White? Yes. And the committee has passed S78 as introduced on a vote of 5 0 0. Thank you. Who would anybody like to report this? I'm reporting the elections bill and the juvenile bill. I'd be happy to do this one no, also. No, but you've got too much on your plate. Senator Rom, do you feel comfortable yeah. enough with this? Yes, yes. Uh, it's okay. good to have a nice short bill as my first bill <laughs> to report out of the committee. So I'd be happy to. And it might be one that wouldn't get you hazed. You know, well, we might, I might get beaten out with economic development anyway. So Okay, <laughs> so, okay. I'll be done with, with the hazing sooner than later. <laughs> and there hasn't been any hazing yet. It's been pathetic. No, it's no well, it's hard. It's hard in this, it's hard to do it in I this know. environment. I, I agree. I am the same. Yep. <laughs> and I shouldn't we'll say save hazing. It all for next year. We'll save it all for next year. Yeah, I shouldn't have said hazing. I think that's probably illegal. You probably made it so, yes. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you, and thank, thank you, you all. Thank you, committee. Thanks. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Patricia, thank you Joe, Tim. Thank you very much for your consideration. Yep, Thanks. thank you. Take care. All right, should we <laughs> so move Jeanette, to, yes. Um, Corey, Senator Parent has to leave somewhat soon. Senator Benning, on the other hand, has nothing else to do today, so. I know, uh, he said he's, that. He's. He's put the gone ice fishing sign on his door. <laughs> so I was just suggesting that we we talk with Senator Parent first and Senator Benning has all the time in the world. I, I think you're right. So Senator Parent, I have not seen, do you have the, do you have language yet or are you just gonna talk to us about concept? So I, I just got um, discussionary language. I would, I would probably look to make some changes in this before officially submitting it to you folks, um, but I, I can talk in concept. Okay. Um, and, and I'll, I'll uh, tell a little story about town meeting day um, last week, I think to highlight where I'm going. Um, so in, in my day job, I actually worked for the town of St. Albans and uh, we were, uh, we look very similar to the city of St. Albans. We uh, both share the, a name. We both have 5,100 registered voters um, last week, the city of St. Albans had 827 voters to the town of St. Albans is 1,880. The town of St. Albans chose to mail ballots for town meeting day. The city of St. Albans did not. Um, we gave them that piece. And I, and I think, you know, I commend you on S15 that the goal to increase participa 
participation in our democracy. I think Vermont's been known for that. We, we have a long, rich history of town meeting day, but times are changing. Um, you know, more and more Vermonters uh, are like Senator Rahm and I, we're, we're younger, we're busy, we work. Um, you know, I, I've never lived in a community that had a town meeting, but as a Senator, I visited some and they're in the middle of the work day and, and it's harder to see young people um, at those. Um, and so while I, I support where you're going with S15, I, I think it needs to include all elections. Um, for example, you know, the weekend before I was uh, town meeting day, I was talking to my parents who live in the city of St. Albans and I go, you guys going to vote on Tuesday? And they go, well, the city hasn't mailed us our ballots yet. And I go, well, they're not going to. And they go, well, they did in November. And I go, but they're not going to for these elections. Um, so you need to go or, you know, Monday vote early or go Tuesday. And um, they went and voted uh, um, uh, Tuesday. So the piece I want to bring up too is, so I, I'm a numbers nerd and I've yet to be on a committee that really plays with a ton of numbers, except Joe's committee in the afternoon this year. So um, most of the legislators don't know where I dig into things, but um, before this election, non-presidential primary town meeting day elections in St. Albans town for the last decade averaged 1,010 voters, um, even with, sta with a standard deviation of about 82, which that means statistical practice would tell you there was a 99.7% uh, likelihood that turnout was going to be between 750 votes and 1,250 votes. So our 1880 outperformed our statistical high watermark by over 50%. Um, it, it, it increased turnout on town meeting day by 85%. Um, our select board obviously saw the value in doing that. Um, so my amendment I'm putting forward is that we expand vote by mail to all elections in the state of Vermont and, and make it a requirement. The one caveat I did, because I understand this is where it become a, a hot potato was only for towns on town meeting day that already choose to vote by Australian ballot. I, I think we can have a longer discussion about what town meeting day looks like in the future, but understand that might not be the right time in this bill. But I think communities like St. Albans city and St. Albans town and a lot of the larger communities in the state who choose to vote by Australian ballot for all elections, we should be mailing ballots. Um, uh, so, so that's that's the language I would be putting forward uh, in a nutshell. Um, I, I think, you know, the importance too is, while we might think the November election is most important because that's how we keep our jobs, I've always found town meeting day to be probably the most important for Vermonters. It's what their school budgets decide uh, are, are decided. It's their local, does the town gonna go $6 million in the debt for a new pool? Are they gonna build a new town hall? Are they gonna buy that fire truck? All those things are decided on town um, meeting day ballots uh, across Vermont and I think are very important to Vermonters. And it's historically been low turnout. And I, I think we need to do everything we can to, to increase that. Um, the other piece that I, I find concerning and I'll raise here is, is an equity issue. So the city of St. Albans, the town of St. Albans and Fairfield also sit in the Maple Run School District. Well, we, town of St. Albans ended up mailing school ballots with those versus the other ones. So does a resident in the city of St. Albans and Fairfield have an equitable access to their ballot? If this goes forward without having some kind of standard form are because one select board chooses to do this versus another, um, you know, and then, you know, one school board may versus another, um, you know, we're not providing all Vermonters that equitable access to a ballot in my mind. So I think I applaud what the committee's doing. Um, I anticipate supporting it on the floor, although I wish it would go further. Um, and that's why I'm in front of you right now. Thank you. There might be some questions, but I'm gonna raise a couple first. Um, First of all, my goal always is to give towns more um, flexibility than less, just in, not just in elections, but in almost everything. I think that we, we dictate um, like uh, parents to, to towns and I would like to have us move away from that. So that's the first thing. And then the, my second um, comment would be, so, what do you do in my town? We vote for the officers 
by Australian ballot, but we everything else is done on the floor. So would we mail out just the the Australian ballot that all all that does is elect the select board and the school board members and the high bailiff and that kind of stuff, but but all the other stuff is done on the floor. I would argue, yes. I mean, all the November election does is elect you and I to come down here and vote on state budgets and other state rules. So yeah, I, I think you would do a mail for your 150 representatives in, in the- oh, No, 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 not, uh, that's not Brattleboro. Oh. No, my, my town of Putney. Um, yeah. But so we would, we would have to mail out ballots to people just to vote on that, but then we'd still have our town meeting and all the other stuff would be voted on at town meeting. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I think that's up for your select board to decide, but I think with the Australian ballots where Australian ballots are required, I think they should be mailed to Vermonters. I think, you know, if the whole goal of this legislation is to increase participation, we're telling you, I mean, I think we could look at, I, I would anticipate at the very least that this bill would include a change to study the communities that did uh, vote by mail in this last town meeting day and look at the the increase in turnout. Because um, to me, in, in all honesty, the hardest part I have with the bill is written. It looks very partisan to me that a bill that you have an election that is only a partisan election in which where you require a vote by mail, but there are other elections in which you say, no, no, we're, we're just not going to do that because it doesn't have the partisan elections necessarily on it. So I think it creates, I think it puts fire in the argument of, of people who, who may not support the overall mission of, the, of, of this bill, who don't like vote by mail. Um, I'm someone who's voted early or by mail every election since at least 2016. Um, might not sound long, but I've only been voting in elections since 20, uh, 2008. Um, so, um, you know, I, I just think mm. I think it just needs to go further. I think it's gonna actually have the opposite effect. I think you'll have high turnouts in November, you'll have lower turnouts on town meeting day because people will get confused. I think it'll it'll cause a lot of mess if we don't have a standard piece. And I totally get your point. I'm a small government Republican, but um, I think sometimes you have to have consistency across the board because that changes with, with town clerks and select boards if we have that flexibility as well. Um, you know, and, and where do we, and where, where are things prioritized? But so would people be confused in Putney if they're, they think they're getting a ballot in the mail and they get a ballot that only elects the select board and the school board members and the high bailiff, but they don't, th there's 23 other articles that they have to vote on and those aren't, they're not getting information on those. So they still have, to, so anyway, I, I, mean, I get your point. And the other, the my last comment would be, you do not want to extend this to primaries. I want to extend it. I think you do. I think you need to. Once I think you do it for one okay. election. I think you have to do it for all elections. Okay, got it. Other committee members? Uh, Senator Clarkson? Corey, thank you. I appreciate you bringing this. Um, I, I'd love to get, the final tally on all the towns that did do mail out voting, because I know there were quite a few in Windsor County that did on town meeting day. Um, did you get a sense of the cost that the towns, uh, how, the, whether the clerks association, would it all be supportive of this just because it will be an increased cost for towns, obviously. Right. And so, not well, every town. What the increased cost was for the town of St. Albans. What was it? $4,000 was not, I mean, it's not a $5 million budget. I'm assuming budgets are gonna be about the size of a town, but uh, I, I don't have budget making in my portfolio at the town, but I can, I could argue with you, we're gonna, we're gonna apply for the state money this year, but I don't think $4,000 is gonna make or break our budget. Right. When it comes yeah, no, that's, to- uh, It's just good to know what, what it was. That I wasn't, wasn't- I, I mean, I, the ballots themselves were like 1800 extra dollars. It wasn't, it's the mailing. It costs a little more, but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't. It's the mailing and the postage. Well, that's and the, the postage. And then, the, and I, I guess you could go to the piece, 
Um, we actually, staff members each took a half day to go and stuff ballots and label them so that our town clerk didn't have to do it all herself. Um, so, you know, we, we say, you know, there's staff time included there, but, um, you know, we actually, it was nice to sit in a conference room and stuff ballots and, and, you know, and, and be a part of the team to get it all out and make it work. Other committee members, Senator Polina. On the one hand, I like the idea of mail out voting because um, it works. I mean, in terms of increasing the participation. Um, on the other hand, what, I'm a, what, what, I, what I don't like about this idea that we're talking about is that it could mean the end of town meeting. Um, you know, I, not only as we know it, but l l basically the end of people getting together to discuss these things in person. And I understand that maybe the wave of the future, we might just start doing town meeting on Instagram at some point or something, but it just worries me. I, I would have to really think hard and long before I would be willing to do something that I thought was going to basically put the kibosh on town meetings. Although I, I appreciate the participation part, I really do. I don't know, but I just, it doesn't feel right to make that kind of decision at this point in time. So what I would have done with language, if, if I may, I, I would have submitted two um, and my goal was, if we had language, was to submit two amendments, figuring this one, if it didn't pass here, um, that I would withdraw on the floor, but also offer that we at least, at the very least, set up a study committee to look at that future of town meeting day and extending this out there. Um, and in the meantime, requiring at least town clerk's mail absentee ballot request for these elections. I think we need to continue to progress. And I think it's easier sell to Vermonters to say, we're still figuring out what to do with town meeting day and primaries and other elections. We have this committee, we know we, the November election worked okay, but we're gonna study and come back and address this. I'd feel more comfortable. What I worry about is we're gonna do this bill and then we're never gonna touch it again, or it's gonna be five years before we touch it again. And I wanna keep the pressure moving forward because I think it's, it's good. So. Um, since I don't have language, I kind of have to show my cards a little, <laughs> a little That's more. Okay. Um, but I would submit to the very least, you know, with, with probably without Senator Polina, uh, support on just increasing um, vote by mail, I, I would submit that at least we put together some language to, to put a study committee together to see how, and it could address, does town meeting day happen later in the year? Um, does March still make sense? Does, you know, you can't go out and talk to your neighbors in the cold winter like we can in the summer when we're campaigning. Um, you know, there are, there are a lot of issues, I think, with where town meeting day is, especially with our legislative calendar. We can't make adjustments early on in the year that can impact a town. So I, I, I think a study committee at the very least um, would, would be helpful to this bill. I, I actually, Senator Rahm, I'm going to call on you in a second here, but I love the idea of studying how we can improve town meeting because, but I think you and I would have a very different approach to how we would do that. But I, I do like the idea of looking at how we, how we improve the participation in town meeting. So I'm happy if this committee would support to work when working with Ameren to, to put together language to at least study that and add it to this bill. Um. So Senator Rahm. So, so I actually think both are very much called for. I think it makes sense to increase access to the town meeting day ballot. You know, I don't want to put the Secretary of State's office on the spot, but they just put a tweet out today that was, you know, retweeted and circulated that said we're increasing access to vote by mail. And that's just going to confuse people if they don't realize that it means only one of the two major elections that we, um, you know, are look forward to every year as Vermonters or every other year. And so, you know, I do think there's a way to increase the opportunity in places where there's Australian ballot and in areas where it helps people access their ability to participate who do have to work, who can't participate in a meeting in the middle of the day. Often it means that certain candidates you know, are disadvantaged if people that would support them can't go to town meeting in the middle of a work day. Um, and so I think we have a reason to look at town meeting and how accessible it is anyway, especially coming out of a pandemic where we've seen that a lot of people said, I'm really grateful to have more opportunities to engage digitally 
than to have to go into a big meeting hall at a specific time of day. Um, so I really would uh, be inclined to support both um, amendments, in fact. But so, I know that the vote may not ultimately go that way, but I would advocate for okay. both. Yeah, I don't know, but I, I just, I think about my town and if you're talking about real decisions, all you're doing by Australian ballot is electing your select board members. That you're not the, whether you're gonna spend $2 million right. on fixing the pool, that isn't gonna be on the ballot. So it's not. I think who makes the decisions about what is up at town meeting day is so much about who's on the select board. And that is no. it can be really inaccessible if you're, if, if you can't vote on that, by Australian ballot, if you have to be there in the middle of the day for that. The, the, you, you can vote by Australian ballot by going to town meeting anytime you want. It isn't, you don't go in the middle of the day to vote by Australian ballot. You go- That's what I'm and, saying, yeah. So you vote by Australian ballot up until seven o'clock. So you stop there and vote and then the, and what goes on the town warning is up to the select board, but anybody can get a petition put on this warning. Anyway, I don't want to. I don't want to prolong this, but I I can't support the first one here. I don't know about the other committee members, but Allison. So uh, it's it's big, it's complex, and it's there are two hundred and fifty one different solutions to town meeting. So I would say that to do an amendment about town meeting voting at this point is way premature because the, the parties that need to weigh in are, 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 are law, there are a lot of yeah. them. And so I, I think that's a little premature, but I, uh, and it's a big, big complex. And as you can hear, I mean, cause Keisha's never lived in a small town like Putney. Putney, you know, Putney town meeting. I will now six. have town meeting in the town of Shelburne. <laughs> <laughs> oh yes, you will. But so, um, I think that the going to a study and looking at the viability, you know, at, at, at town meeting generally with elections as a piece of it, uh, but just looking at the future of town meeting would be a great idea. We've all bemoaned the the decreased participation in town meeting, and yet we all treasure it. So I I think it is a great idea to study it, and um, this is a good prompt to do that. But I think. For us to do an amendment requiring this for town meeting is way premature, and we do not have the time before crossover to take the testimony that would be required from from all the parties. And there are a lot of parties involved in this. In fact, there are two hundred and fifty. Right. Yes, right. Senator That's Palmer, right. have you? Yes, <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I would support both of uh, Senator Parent's amendments. I think you could. If you're worried about people being confused when they get the, the ballot in the mail about the select board races, I think you could easily include a, a piece of information in that same envelope that says, by the way, if you want to weigh in on the money matters, you need to come to town meeting, which is whenever it is. I, I don't see that as a particularly uh, significant obstacle. And I think the study makes a lot of sense. So I would support both. All right. So. Um, yes, yeah, Senator Rahm. Well, I just want to say one more thing to be fair to larger cities, cities as well. You know, Burlington um, does obviously do everything by Australian ballot. I was the civic engagement director and we have neighborhood planning assemblies and they have to go to every single ward and talk about what's on the ballot. And everyone says, I, I always wanted to live in a town that had town meeting but at least we get to have town meeting every month, you know, and go to our local neighborhood planning assembly and hash out all of the things that will be on the ballot, have every city department head come and talk about it. So, you know, our, our big little city of Burlington has constantly thought about ways to have a more participatory process leading up to election day. And I just don't want to discount that our slightly larger communities are, are also thinking about ways to make sure people feel connected to what's on the ballot. I, I agree. And I think there are many ways of increasing participation in town meeting, but they're probably not the same ones that Senator Parent would suggest that that and so I'm okay. Who would we put on this study committee? I think the the League of Cities and Towns, the Town Clerks Association, 
the uh, Secretary of State's office, the um, a couple of select board members, school board. I mean, because you know, it's, it's board, municipal. Part it's, of this. it's municipalities. It isn't you know town meeting. You know, it's also schools because school budgets are what we no vote at town. Town, school but school meetings are separate than town meetings. I know, but they for many of us it's at the same time and it's the same ballot and it's got the same issues. Yep, but um, I don't. I guess I don't want because now we have school districts that are different than the municipality itself so I don't want to I don't want Putney town meeting to be confused with the our school district meeting because they are different and they're not at the same time anymore because we have set their separate municipalities separate so anyway um, I will we'll look forward to your language okay. <laughs> and see anybody else want to comment on this, uh, Chris? You are muted. Try that again. Thank you, Madam Chair, and, and thank you, committee members. For the record, Chris Winters, Deputy Secretary of State. And I, I do just want to say we agree these are issues that ought to be studied. Uh, we wish that we had all the time in the world to do a study like this, but I do just want to say that we came just came off a really challenging election year with less staff than we need. And as we know, it's, there's a, an additional staff member in this bill before you. Um, and with vote by mail passing, uh, if it passes, we're going to have a lot of work in front of us to put the procedures in place, to put new software in place. Plus, we're going through an RFP, RFP process for new tabulators. So I do just want to make sure that the committee is, is aware that this is a great thing to study. We think it's a little bit early. And if you do wish to do some studies like this, that we um, push them off appropriately to, to dates in the future that would make them doable uh, for the amount of work and the amount of staff that we have. Thank you. Anybody else want to weigh in on this? Um, Paul? Paul? Can I ask a, a clear one question of, of Chris before we move on? I, I don't want to put you on the spot, Chris, but I couldn't tell if you were against the study or the change to the election. Um, if, you were, if you were sharing that you feel like there's not enough time to make this change for town meeting day or you don't have the capacity to do the study. Sure. Thank you, Senator. It's actually on both. It's the study and, uh, that we would want to put that off to some date in, in the future once we've got more vote by mail uh, in place. Remember that we came through this baptism by fire, doing it by the seat of our pants in 2020, and, and luckily it, it came off really, really well. We want to make sure we get this vote by mail bill into place and running smoothly for the general election. Um, so I would also say that it, uh, on behalf of the Secretary of State's office that it's too early at this point to expand it also to the primary into town meeting day as um, some kind of mandate because we haven't studied those issues enough yet either. We're trying to take small steps forward for successful vote, vote by mail. That's why what um, you know, we've recommended to, to put in the bill and, and the committee has agreed with for the most part are small achievable steps to do what we did in 2020. Once we get 2022 under our belts, we'll know how that worked. We'll have more data on how it increases participation, what goes well, what doesn't. And, and then I think we'll be in a better position to assess in a couple of years, do we expand it to the primary? Should it be more expanded for town meeting day and school and annual budgets? And the study could be a part of that. Paul, did you have your hand up? Yes, for the record, Paul Burns, executive director of VPIRG. And um, I wanted to, say, echo some of the same uh, sentiments, I think, that Chris Winters just just uh, had. But I, I would say, too, I want to um, express uh, a lot of interest in what Senator Parent has brought to the table here um, and these issues of providing equal access to the ballot for or to the decision making process for town meeting day is is absolutely fair. I mean, they're totally legitimate issues as Senator Rahm and others have, have noted as well. So I, I, at some point, I think that's worthy of consideration. I don't think 
we would not support trying to put it into this bill now for the reasons that, that you all have been discussing, but um, because we wanna move this forward. You may recall at the beginning of this process, we also called for more study, recognizing that you were not gonna have the opportunity to do everything that we thought was a great idea with um, universally mailed ballots. So the idea of addressing or considering um, ballots that are postmarked by election day, for instance, and um, requiring clerks to, um, uh, at least record the number of ballots that come in after election day. So there are there are other things that you could look at over time. Um, uh, and the next thing that I think we would want to see you consider or the state to consider would be looking at mailing out ballots for the presidential primary in early uh, 2024, for instance. But you'd have a chance to do that after the 2022 election, as Chris Winters said. So, um, so yes to the study, totally legitimate. And I think I might support both what Senator White wants and what Senator Parent wants in terms of things that you could do to encourage more participation in local elections. So maybe we can find some common ground there. So I, I'm just gonna add one, one thing here. We're, we're looking at, I happen to love town meeting. And, but I think that town meeting, and I'm gonna say this because I always have to, that town meeting doesn't have as much significance as it should because we as a state take the decisions away from the towns. And so if we allowed towns to have more, but maybe we can't have 250 different um, governance units for our towns. Maybe we need to read Frank Bryan and John McClowry's Vermont papers and go in that direction. I mean, there, if, we're to, if, if we're really looking at town meeting and what it means and and how we have more participation and how we have more real decision-making power in those towns. Maybe we need to not just look at the issue of should we mail out ballots or shouldn't we, but we really need to look at the whole institution of town meeting and what it means and how for the 21st century. That's, that's my little speech for the day. So we'll look forward to your, yes, Allison. So uh, I don't believe uh, if we did a study, whether it's this year or, I mean, we could do with phase one and phase two, we can't actually, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but we can't actually do anything about it next session. We would have to do something about it in January of 23, because that's the next time we'll be able to make election law changes, correct? The, the question, I guess the question is, how is this going to be worded? Is it a, is it a study about how to increase, um, per, how to make town meeting more meaningful? Or is it how to, should we mail out ballots or shouldn't we mail out ballots? Because they're, they're very different questions. And how do we make town meeting more meaningful to the towns and to the um, people who are making the decisions? Is a very different question than should we should we mail out ballots or I, I not? Agree. So, I, I agree. I well, agree. part of part of why I'm asking this question. We can't what, technically do this uh, 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 enact changes in election law until the next time we could do it is twenty in twenty three. Yes, but my right? question wasn't so. A I, change I know. Code. So phase, okay. So let me just finish my thought, which is. You know, I, I think that there are some big questions about the, you know, how do we make, how do we help keep town meeting uh, resilient and viable for the 21st century? I think those are big questions that could be addressed right now. Um, well, sorry, did I miss? I, it, they can, but we're not going to do it in an amendment to this bill because we, I believe that if we're going to really look at how we study town meeting, we have to have, before we even come to a decision of what the wording should be, we have to have a conversation with those players that are involved in town meeting. I mean, I, I don't know what, the, Corey, I don't know what your language is going to say, but I very much fear, um, the more I think about it, setting up a study to look at town meeting that's gonna, we're gonna ask for to be done in four months or five months, because I think it, we've been trying to figure out town meeting for years. And I think it needs a real thorough um, look. So I'm, I'm not opposed to, to doing a study, but I don't know what the study would look at and when it would be due and 
how it would be administered. I, so. I'm happy. I mean, I don't know what our timeline is for this bill going on the floor, but I think if I had a day working with Amarin, I think I hear what you're saying, Madam Chair, and I, I'd be willing to put language that I think is as neutral as possible on what the direction of town meeting day is, but ask to consider various options include, you know, a lot of times like we do, you know, the question could be, how do we increase participation in town meeting day? A, consider what the impact of vote by mail would be, consider these, you know, let the group go where they may go and wander and come back in a year, year and a half. Sure. And, yep. you know, do it. I'm not saying we need to fix it for next town meeting day or 23, but I just, I think I think you're going to just like I said at the end of the day I think you're going to see a depressive effect on elections that don't mail ballots when we have mail ballots and you're going to get the counter argument you know what you're going for mm -hmm. which I think at the sole heart of all this is we want more Vermonters to have more say in how they're governed. Yeah, I agree with you. That's the that's the question. Yeah. And so so I would suggest that you work with Amarin and um, come back to us. Um, we haven't scheduled anything for Thursday well, and Friday. Okay. And, uh, Will, um, has, Will has his hand up. Yes, I see that. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Will? Will? Thank you. I didn't mean to interrupt Senator White. Um, can I just make one clarifying point that I think will help as people go their way and are thinking about this subject? And it's specifically to respond to something Senator Rahm mentioned and i just want to make clear that the decision right now of whether a town conducts either all or part of its business by australian ballot instead of the floor right instead of a floor meeting is a decision squarely right now under current law in the hands of the voters not the various select boards yes so it empowers voters to decide to switch to australian ballot and on what subject matter within the meeting to do so budget officers other public questions they can force a vote on that issue by a petition. That's a petition that a board would have to honor because the voters are specifically empowered in statute to make that decision. So if they get 5% of signatures and ask their board to vote on moving to Australian ballot, that's 100% doable right now. And it, and it can be reversed by the voters. They can say, oh, we really didn't like that. We're going back to the floor meeting. I just wanted to put that out there. So I actually, I appreciate sort of the <laughs> suggestion by Senator Parent that if this ever was going to occur, that you would write it in such a way that it only applied to those places that had already decided to adopt that Australian ballot system. And then I think you're less having the discussion about whether that choice of mailing, whether you ask those municipalities to mail their ballots proactively is an affront to the actual institution of the floor meeting, because these are in places where they've already decided to conduct this business by ballot. Um, that being said, I think I, I support everything, of course, the Deputy Secretary said, and that this needs serious and significant thought. And so I think a study is the right way to go. And just if I may, I think somebody threw it out there, even Senator Parent, you said maybe not 22 or 23. When you really think about the elections calendar and your legislative calendar, it does no good to have a study come back next January on this. Right. Because we're not going to get it in place for the 2022 meetings. Then I just have to put out there that then me and my staff are in a general election throughout 22. And it will be very difficult for us to put a lot of attention on this as we administer the first vote by mail election in 2022. So I think as far as a deadline for a study committee goes, I would appreciate the committee thinking about 2023. And in that case, potentially July of that year would make sense. All right, so we'll, um, I'm going to just stop for one minute here and ask Gail. Gail, I see you have your hand up. Is there something we need uh, to know? Yes, Madam Chair, you are wanted in Senate Finance at 415. Oh, okay. What time is it now? It's 411. Okay. So, I have to step off, but I appreciate your time and I'll, I'll be in touch. Okay, great. Thank you. And now, um, now we get to go to Senator Benning and Anthony, what I'm going to do is um, just, he, we have the language and it is posted. Right. Um, and this is a, 
not as much of a philosophical change as a, um, I see this more as a technical change that Senator Bending is bringing to us. And I think that, um, so I'm gonna let you take over again. And um, I think that we want to have the Secretary of State weigh in on, on this as well. Is that okay? Sure. I'm going to um, <clears throat> now defend um, giving the cannabis money to towns. <laughs> Go so for I'll, it. I'll see you, you later. Girl. Bye. Senator Benning, where are Good you? Afternoon. There, you are. there you are. Joe Benning, Caledonia County State Senator from the wonderful town of Linden, population a little over 5,000, where we've battled the issue of town meeting for ages. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that when I conclude. Um, I'm bringing an amendment, which I hope you all have seen. I would like to start by uh, saying, I see Senator Clarkson has her hand up. <laughs> it's not on our web page. At least I don't see it on the web page. So I'm no, just I, it, yeah, it's it on is. the web page. It is. Uh, it, uh, it, on today's date, I don't. I, I don't see it. I mean, it says proposed amendment ballot collecting. Ah, uh, okay, got it. Sorry, thank you. Okay. Thank you. So let me say first, Amarin, I want to thank you. Uh, we've never officially met before, and you did some work for me when we were just emailing back and forth. It's a pleasure to meet you for the first time. Um, and Vice Chair Polina, it's a, a pleasure to be back on the committee for a little bit. Just watching all of your facial expressions has been quite entertaining this afternoon. But I did send Corey a note saying, remind me next time never to let you go first. Um, <laughs> It is also nice to see Chris Winters, who I had not recognized until he started speaking. It's nice to see that both you and I need a haircut. And uh, Will Setting, nice to see you again. It looks like you put on a pound or two since the last time I saw you. The rest of your committee uh, probably doesn't know it, but I used to goof around a lot with these guys when I was on this committee, and it's a pleasure to see you all again. And I fully anticipate them responding in kind shortly. Um, I've brought an amendment because way back in ancient times, specifically May of 1983, when I graduated from law school, we had a list of things called ethical rules. And one of the ethical rules that we had uh, been required to memorize before we actually graduated was this term that a lawyer should avoid the appearance of impropriety. Now, why would that be significant at this moment in time? Um, I commend the committee for convincing me with the mail-in ballot system that we now have had in place in the 2020 election, um, that it actually did increase numbers in my town. And my town clerk, who is as Republican, if not more so than I am, uh, we had discussions about that prior to its being implemented and our concerns about whether or not that might lead to some fraudulent activity. We both agreed that we had no proof that that would happen. Uh, we had concerns that it was an invitation for something to happen, but afterwards we were both very pleased that nothing actually did happen. So as a result, I've turned a corner on how I present myself on this issue. And in fact, the last time around, I was very much opposed to it. Um, the one thing that had me concerned was I was hearing about um, legislators who were going around collecting ballots from various locations. And in my eyes, that is something that does not avoid the appearance of impropriety. So I said to Amber, and I'd like to have some language in this bill as an amendment, um, hoping that it would be considered a friendly amendment and that it would um, actually make very clear that the Senate was taking a positive position on the fact that legislators should not be participating in the retrieval of ballots from various quarters. So she came up with this language and you might wonder why uh, it appears here the way it does. And I can assure you it was not pulled out of thin air. And I'm watching for Chris Winters and Will Senning to see which one of them first says, huh, I've seen this language before. 
Well, that's because the Secretary of State's office actually had this very language sent out to all of the clerks um, in the 2020 elections directive. This is not my personal language. This is actually the Secretary of State's office language that went out to all of the uh, ballot clerks, as I understand it. So it's really kind of simple. It is saying that if you are a candidate, you should not be going around collecting ballots. And if you are a candidate's campaign staff, I'm happy to hear if any of you actually have that kind of a person working for you, because I certainly don't. But if you do have a person who is a campaign staffer, they should not be going around collecting the ballots either. Um, the language is not that complicated. I'm happy to read it to you or have Amarin read it to you and explain it to you. But that really is the upshot of what the amendment seeks to do. I'm gonna pause here before I go into my closing story, um, but I'd like to know if anybody has any questions, thoughts or concerns. I'll say that it, in my eyes, is a positive statement and I'm saying this as the chair of the Senate's ethics committee, this is something we can actually hold up to the public and say, look, we're trying to be squeaky clean in this process. So I will leave it at that and take questions. Are there questions? Or if not, I'm gonna ask for comments from the Secretary of State's office. Senator Rahm. Um, thanks, Senator Benning. First of all, I feel personally attacked because I usually do have a campaign staff person, <laughs> but I just really like paying young people to get involved in the political process. Um, so I, I hear that, you on that, this. That, that was not meant to be a direct attack. Right, no, it's fine. I was just very happy if somebody <laughs> actually did have that. Yeah. Well, you're actually, your your district, your Senate district is so different than the rest of ours. Oh, yeah. that <laughs> it's, 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 yeah. It gets an exemption. Right. Well, so, but actually that, you know, is, is part of my question. I also wanted to say I, as a justice of the peace, when they put out a call for help from justices of the peace said, I cannot participate in this because of the conflict as, as a candidate on the ballot. Um, I don't have your language in front of me. Do you distinguish between, how do you define a campaign staff person? Because some people pay stipends, some people pay an intern, some yeah. people have an unpaid intern. Um, the language is, I'm um, just skimming down through. It's probably quicker for me to just read this. It, it's only like two paragraphs and they're very sure. short paragraphs. A candidate whose name appears on the ballot for that election or a campaign staff member of any such candidate may not return a ballot to the town clerk or to secure ballot drop box unless that candidate or campaign staff member one is returning the candidates or campaign staff members own ballot. Two is returning the ballot of an immediate family member as defined in 17 BSA section 2532, including a person's spouse, children, brothers, sisters, parents, spouses, parents, grandparents, spouses, grandparents, who has requested their assistance with the return of that ballot. Three is returning the ballot of a voter for whom the candidate or campaign staff member is a caretaker and who has requested their assistance with that return of the ballot or is a justice of the peace performing his or her official duties pursuant to 17 BSA 2538. The clerk or other local election official accepting the return of ballots shall not be required to enforce the provisions of subsection E of this section but shall report any suspected violations to the Secretary of State's office, who shall then refer them to the Attorney General's office for investigations. Candidates violating this section may be subject to penalties pursuant to 17 BSA section 2017. It doesn't actually define, it kind of comes in the back door to explain what that person might be eligible to do, um, but I can't, I don't, have any language here that offers an exact description in case you to answer your question. So, so I would say two things. One, I, you know, I don't think the candidate, even if they're a justice of the peace should, should deliver the ballot. I, you know, so I don't, I, when I heard in that language, I wasn't sure if it was saying candidate or campaign staff person. Yeah. You no, know, et cetera. Right. And I, I don't, I, I said, I don't think it's appropriate for me as a candidate, as a justice of the peace, both to 
to still go pick up someone's ballot. Um, so I, I would, L I don't know how you feel about that change. The second thing I wanted to raise is just, um, I, I hope this wouldn't include, oh, they're a volunteer in the neighborhood and, you know, they're putting out a lawn sign on somebody's lawn and they say, hey, you know, are you going to take a bunch of ballots back? You know, I, I don't know where we draw the line between what counts as a staffer, if they're paid or not, if, if that's the distinguishing line. Well, I guess I would have to turn to um, our representatives from the Secretary of State's office to ask that question because this language came directly from them. Yeah, I would, I would also say that to me, that's the key question. You know, if somebody's just volunteering around the office and around the campaign, do they come under this campaign staff definition or do they have to be paid staff? You know, just what do we mean by a campaign staff? It, it might be an easy cure by just simply putting the word paid in front of campaign staff. And I don't know if the Secretary of State's office ever thought of that, but I certainly would welcome that as an addition to this. Yep. Any wisdom from Chris? Sure, thank you, Senator. I'll just very, very briefly, and then um, I would defer to Will Senning. Uh, I was about to say how terrible this language is. Uh, thank the Senator for reminding us that we probably wrote it. Uh, I'm just kidding there. We, we did in fact put this in into a, an elections directive in 2020 in response to a lot of concerns that we heard when the bill was being debated, the two times that it came through the legislature in 2020, and there was a lot of concern about uh, so-called ballot harvesting and voter fraud and bad things that could happen. Um, and we just didn't think that that was um, going to happen. And in 2020, it did, did not happen. We've had a little bit of testimony in this about the seven complaints that we did refer to the attorney general's office and only one of those being actionable. And it was not related to um, return of ballot by, by someone who wasn't authorized to return the ballot on behalf of the, the candidate, the um, voter. Um, so I, we like the, the, the language. We obviously use the language. Um, Will can talk about how we interpreted the language. Um, I think the committee has to decide whether the language is actually necessary given our, given our experience in, in 2020. Um, I think Senator Benning is right to point out this appearance of impropriety. It's something I talk to uh, a lot of people about in my years as board counsel to board members and, and how the appearance is sometimes uh, just as bad as the actual impropriety when you're talking about the integrity of a system. So um, I've given a lot of legal advice on recusal and appearance of impropriety. And so I agree it's a very uh, legitimate concern and something that we should pay attention to. Um, and with the chair's permission, I'd defer to the Director of Elections, uh, Mr. Senning, and uh, his experience with this language and uh, how it was used in the 2020 election. Um, thank you. Well, well. Sure. <clears throat> thanks, Chris. And thanks, Senator Benning. I'm going to try to get through this, even though I'm trying to get around how, how self-conscious I am right now about the weight that I've put on over the last year. <laughs> You do know I was kidding, right? I don't want to get called on the carpet later on. And, and you're free to return the insult anytime. Right? Totally fine. It's totally fine. It's also true. Um, so Chris, Chris, I think, hit on the appropriate points. Senator Benning is right. We did include this language in the first directive about last year's elections in response to concerns that he and others had raised about the issue. Um, I just want the committee to recognize, just know what you're doing, which is this is kind of and would be the only place in the bill where you're limiting the return options of a voter. Um, I will acknowledge that it's a, it's a very minor limit to those return options, um, especially with the exceptions carved out for family members. Um, and so I think it's, I think it's a minor limit, but it is a limit. I think when we discussed this concept um, both last year and then again this year, as we were talking about the permanent vote by mail bill, you did take some testimony from clerks um, about their experience with folks returning ballots for other people and how that's very helpful in some circumstances um, for people who lack the ability to leave their homes. Um, or do so readily. It just, just can be a very easy process for some folks to have a acquaintance, family member, whoever that may be, return their ballot for them if they're not able to. 
Um, I think, I'm sorry, I, I don't believe that Senator Benning described, um, aside from the appearance of impropriety, which I understand and also, you know, learned in my legal education, um, what I've heard from other folks is that part of the risk that this is trying to address is uh, the possibility of sort of coercion and undue influence on those voters, that if a candidate is returning their ballot, they somehow may feel obligated to vote for that candidate. So I think if you would agree that's part of the concern as well as just the, the appearance that that's what you wanna do is you wanna weigh is the, is the limitation on the um, available means of return worth it to address the risk of that possible coercion and undue influence on voters. And also to, to as Senator Benning described, sort of put a statement in the law that we're, we take this seriously and we're trying to address these kind of concerns. Um, so overall, I think the, the, our office wouldn't be opposed to this provision being added to the bill, um, although we're not convinced that it's entirely necessary. Um, I don't see it, a lot of harm that it will cause. And I would just mention, I, I like that language. I wonder who drafted it, that um, doesn't put any responsibility on the town clerks to engage in enforcement, because I think that puts them in a very difficult position. Um, the town clerks may or may not know who all the candidates on the ballot are, or certainly who their staff persons are. Um, and also when you think about the allowance for drop boxes that's currently in the bill, there's of course the risk that a candidate or candidate staff could drop ballots off at a drop box, is a drop box without the clerk's knowledge. So putting no responsibility on the clerk for either of those things occurring, I think is important, but that language is in here. And at the same time, it says if they do have a sense that the provision has been violated, they should notify our office and that we notify the attorney general. So again, Senator Polina, I think um, we're not opposed to the amendment from the secretary of state's office. But on the one hand, you're, I, you're not crazy about it, it sounds. I mean, I think it's, it's my, my feeling is that are we putting ourselves on a, not a slippery slope, but we're sort of, we're sort of implying that we think there's impropriety and we're reacting to it when in our hearts, we know that there, and the reality is we know that there has not been any that, that we should be concerned about. So I wonder whether it's putting something on the radar that doesn't need to be there. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not taking a position yet. I'm just saying that that's, that's the feeling I get that are we doing something that's unnecessary in order to react to something that doesn't exist. That's not a problem. But Joe? Yeah, Anthony, I was aware of all the conflict the last time around where you had um, party officials, especially from my side, making arguments that ballot harvesting was going to be taking place, et cetera, et cetera. I think any organization that collects ballots it's fair for both sides. If VPIRG wants to go collect ballots, or if the some entity of the Republican wing decides they wanna go and, and work to collect ballots, I don't really have a big uh, snafu with that at all. What my concern was, I heard that there were actually legislators who were doing this. And I'm not right. saying that there was any nefarious intent on their part, or that there was actually anything um, ill will on their part, the bottom line for me is all of us as senators, especially, we should not be involved in this in any way and should be taking a positive step to say, we understand that we are expanding the process for people to be able to vote. That is a noble cause, but the candidates themselves should be able to say, you know what, we are squeaky clean in the process. And that is avoiding the appearance of impropriety that I was concerned about. And that's why I brought this language. And frankly, was very surprised that the Secretary of State's office had also had the same thought process in the 2020 election. So I'll say again, this is their language. I am not suggesting that anybody violated anything or did anything with ill intent but we as candidates should be absolutely squeaky clean and your bill provides a vehicle for us to make that positive statement to the public. Point well taken. Is there any other comments? Paul, do you have any comments? 
Oh, I'm sorry, Senator Colmer. Thank you, Senator Colmer. Yeah, I, I agree that I don't think it implicates or, or pretends to suggest any uh, mischief has been going on either. I think it, on the other hand, I take, I take a look at it 180 degrees the other way. I think it reaffirms the uh, cleanliness of our election process, if you will. I think it's out there for everybody to see and it affects only the can or the uh, candidate and the campaign workers or worker. Uh, so I don't, I don't see it as a negative thing at all. And uh, it's already been out there from the Secretary of State's office. So I don't think it's anything new either. Yeah. So I support it. Other comments? Paul, did you want to say something? Uh, thank you, Senator. For the record, Paul Burns, Executive Director of VPIRG. Um, I appreciate Senator Benning's uh, tailored approach to, um, to this issue and his concern. I, I'll just say that we, we didn't support this language when the Secretary of State put it forward the first time uh, as part of last year's emergency legislation. So I, I, and that's mostly because we didn't see the need for it. And that um, as Will Senning pointed out, this, is the, this would be the one area of the law that, that makes it slightly at least more difficult to participate and puts a, you know, a, a, a small burden potentially in, in front of somebody who wants to have their ballot uh, submitted. It becomes more of an issue, of course, as this underlying legislation is mailing out ballots to everyone. So you're gonna have more people with their ballot at home looking to make sure that that ballot is returned and, and counted. Um, so it's a bigger issue than ever before when we simply have the absentee ballot process. Uh, so I, I'm not convinced that it's necessary and would prefer not to see any new hurdles put in place. But as I say, I appreciate the narrow, uh, the narrowly tailored approach that Senator Benning is suggesting. I appreciated what Senator Rahm suggested and, and, and what was heading toward perhaps a, a even further narrowing of the language to at least ensure that this is paid staff that it would refer to or, or maybe just the candidates themselves. Um, but I, um, I, I think the basic, my basic bottom line is that we, you know, um, I'm somewhat agnostic if it goes forward as, as this, we, we're not you know, in support of it. We would certainly so strongly support the legislation even if it had this amendment in it um, because it has so much good uh, to it. We just didn't see the need for it and, and thought that it's a, a modest um, uh, new hurdle that would be placed in front of folks to get their ballot submitted. Thank you. Senator Clarkson. So I'll be the last to weigh in on the committee. I And Senator White needs to weigh in. Um, yeah, I like, you know, I like to solve problems and this wasn't a problem. Uh, I, I sort of agree with Anthony. It's, um, and by calling it out, we identify it as a possible problem. And so I'm, I'm sort of torn about it. I, I think it's narrow. I appreciate it, Joe. I mean, I, I, and I appreciate, but I feel like the Secretary of State's put it out as a, as a guidance sort of somewhat under duress because of the political fractiousness that surrounded this year's election, last year's election. You know, we didn't have this problem. So I, to identify it and to call it out to me does exactly that sort of sh shines a spotlight on it where there wasn't a problem. So I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm a little torn. Um, I, you know, I, I, I'm not sure I'm fully as agnostic as Paul. I think, uh, you know, I, I feel, a little bit more like Anthony, um, but I'm, I'm, I'm letting it sit with me for a bit. I, I would just say, sorry. No, go ahead. Um, I, I don't know that we, you know, want to wait for it to become a problem. I mean, I, I just thought the ethical thing to do was really steer clear of any appearance that I was influencing someone's vote by showing up at a senior center or you know somewhere to say I'm taking your ballot you know so I just think it was we probably issued it as guidance because it seemed like a good way to build trust in our mail in voting process frankly and and I come from a very competitive world of politics where you know I would otherwise love the opportunity to sort of know I've just secured a vote you know but I just I think the appearance of it is unethical um, and, and I would narrow the language to make sure that we're talking about someone paid 
to work on a campaign and to make sure that even though I'm a justice of the peace, that doesn't give me any more right to be to be the one as a candidate to pick up someone's ballot. Um, Keisha, if I could respond, Anthony. Um, sure. I meant to tell you before that with respect to the justice of the peace language, it is my understanding that in the statute, if a justice of the peace goes to collect the ballot, they're supposed to go with one justice from each party. Right. Will and Chris can correct me if I'm wrong, but that's yeah. that's my understanding. Well, so there's at least some insulation there for that concern, but I agree with you. If I was going solely um, and I'm a justice of the peace, I, I think that is really dancing on the lines of giving people the impression that I'm doing something nefarious, even though I'm not and I have no intention of doing so. Right, um, right. Every so, time they do uh, elections in nursing homes or assisted living, Every, there's always a, a, a justice of the peace from both parties or a member of the BCA from one from each party or more. Yeah, I mean, we already have provision for that. So just for the record, um, Amarin, I'm happy to put the word paid in front of the, okay. um, the campaign staffer. And I appreciate all of your time. Uh, if I can get Paul to say he's agnostic on something, I think I've really come a long way. <laughs> um, and I'll close out with uh, something you said earlier, Senator Polina, about town meeting. I'd fight hand, tooth, and nail to keep town meeting, if at all possible, in any way, shape, or form. And my, uh, my history with that goes back to October 28th of 1986, when the town of Linden first talked about moving portions of its town meeting into an Australian ballot system. And I fought so hard against that. You may wonder why do I remember that particular date of October 28, 1986? Well, because my very nine month pregnant wife was sitting next to me as I did that. And she went home that evening and went into labor with our first child. So that's a day <laughs> I'll never forget. A town meeting day story. Yes, indeed. And what, yeah, I, I'm just curious, where is Lindenville now? Lindenville, um, oh, unfortunately, sorry. has moved more towards the Australian ballot system. And the person who has been arguing for that the longest is a person who was convinced that the school budget would be shot down if they had more people voting. And we they were never, wrong. We have okay. never shot down our our budget right. and it is really frustrating to watch the evaporation of what I consider to be one of Vermont's most cherished prizes and as Joni Mitchell once said you don't know what you got until it's gone yeah until it's gone it's true, true that okay thank you all very much and nice to see say, you guys all again and I would cool. say um I mean adding the word paid makes a difference for me as well it moved me in that direction we're not going to take a vote now because we just wait for Jeanette to come back and do that. So we'll probably do it tomorrow. I assume Emeryn can take you a nanosecond to put paid into the bill, into the amendment. Um, and we can just yeah, find some time tomorrow to make a decision. Okay. I don't nice think to you see all you guys again. Back. Appreciate Thanks. seeing you. And uh, feel free to send me back nasty emails and comments in response. Thank you, Joe. That was great. Good night, Thanks guys. Thanks a lot. Thank you.